all has to do with lending, if you recall yesterday, we had two lending panels. The first lending panel last yesterday was if you wanted to buy mobile homes and needed money. The second lending panel was if you were trying to develop channel lending where your resident could get direct loans. So those are the focus of the two panels yesterday. The focus of the panel today, we have four experienced uh, people in the lending business to help you finance your park. This is to buy the park. And so we are organized. We've got Clint on the left with American Commerce Bank, uh, Chris with Yale Capital, and this third with Hunt Mortgage, and we've got Lou with Lutz Capital on the end. They'll say their first uh, you know, introductory remarks, is, and then we'll take the questions and answers. Take it away, Thank you, Dave. Um, so would you kind of like me to uh, kind of go over the program that we offer? Or, uh, yes. Um, what we've asked them to do is just give a little recap of what kind of lending they prefer to do that they're best at for park acquisitions, um, some you know, details about qualifications of the, of the, of the purchaser, uh, um, details of the properties you like, maybe LTVs or, or recourse, and geographical opportunities of where you can make loans. Certainly, okay. Um, well, first of all, uh, Clint Calvert from American Commerce Bank. Um, we are a community bank located just west of Atlanta on I-20 in a town called Freeman, Georgia. And uh, we've, we've been in the uh, mobile home lending business for, for quite a few years now. Um, it's uh, something that, uh, that, that, that we in the bank, uh, we like, we like the asset class. We've had good success finding um, good, hardworking operators that, uh, that like to make money. Uh, when we first kind of uh, got into the business of uh, lending on communities, um, we, we kind of tried to put a program together. Um, where we had, uh, you know, kind of set terms, um, set LTV, um, set rates. Um, it, you know, it's really kind of a standardized program. And what we found is that, uh, you know, every community is different and every operator is different. And uh, we found that uh, it really makes a lot more sense um, to be more flexible with the terms and things that, uh, that, that we offer for community acquisitions, for refis, uh, for putting homes uh, into the community. Uh, but, uh, you know, we do typically like uh, to see at least 20% down. Sometimes it, it makes sense um, to require less than 20%, but we usually like to see at least 20% equity in the deal. Um, the more equity in the deal, um, the better your, your other terms are going to be, the better your rate's going to be. Um, you know, more equity uh, means the bank sees it as lower risk. Uh, but uh, we, we also typically um, don't like to, to see amortizations longer than 20 years. Um, every now and then, uh, it makes sense to go 25 years. Um, sometimes if homes are financed separately from uh, the real estate, uh, we might offer 25 years on the real estate and uh, a shorter amortization on the, on the homes. Uh, but uh, another thing that I'll mention that we offer is we offer fully amortizing loans. So no balloon payments, no interim maturities. You know, um, if you close a 20 year loan with us, uh, as long as you're making your payments, you're gonna have it with us for 20 years. You know, we're not gonna give you a call in five years and say, hey, you know, you've got this balloon payment, we're not renewing your loan. And what that does is, uh, you know, gives you some peace of mind. You know that, uh, that you've got a home with us and also saves you from uh, closing costs and appraisal fees every few years. Um, so that's, uh, that's something that uh, a lot of our customers have uh, been happy to hear about. Uh, and uh, with the fully amortizing loan, I'll also mention we don't have prepayment penalties, which is something else that uh, has, has received a warm welcome. Uh, but uh, anyway, I guess I'll uh, pass the microphone along and you know, happy to answer any questions um, here or outside afterwards. Good morning, everyone. Chris San Jose from Yale Capital Advisors. Uh, we are a financing firm based out of Florida, uh, range financing nationwide, and we act as the intermediary you know, between park owners and banks. Um, you know, that starts with helping facilitate transactions from you know, the starting of collection of documentation and underwriting the properties to maximize the values, you know, find what the right debt coverages are, and you know, figure out sort of tailor the right financing solution for different deals depending on whether it's takeout financing to, you know, for a stabilized property, 
versus you know property with lower occupancy that's going to need some flexibility to cash out more money you know over time as you you know make the improvements you're looking to do and from that stage we work with presenting to a variety of banks and you know, can save you a lot of time from not having to reach out to the wrong banks for the wrong types of deals you know everyone in the room you know knows of certain sources whether they're local banks or certain agency or conduit shops but not every deal can fit into every one of those boxes and so we, we save a lot of time by knowing what the right directions for deals are and uh, knowing, let's say, a you know, two or three million dollar loan on a stabilized community is going to be a great candidate for an agency loan or a condo loan versus a you know, 30 site community that might have some vacancies and park one homes. We know not to waste time with maybe a condo loan or an agency loan and better to bring that to banks like American Commerce or local community banks you know, in that state or region. Um, you know, the, the underwriting of the property is really the core of, you know, the most important piece of making sure that you're getting everything that you can out of that property, especially when it comes to a cash out refinance or when you're looking at an acquisition where the seller might have been including, you know, personal expenses that need to be removed from the numbers, um, where if you were just to present those tax returns and P&Ls to a bank, they might not be able to find the right you know, sizing, the right debt coverage, to, to make the right loan for you. Um, we, you know, this year to date we've closed around 250 million in loans just from mobile parks, um, and that's nationwide. Although we're based in Florida, we seem to do more business outside of Florida than in the state. Um, so again, yeah, look forward to your questions. I have Ann Stewart with Hunt Mortgage Group. Um, Hunt is uh, based in New York. Uh, we are a direct lender. We lend on all uh, commercial property types, including mobile home parks. Um, I'm going to speak with speak to you about our agency program, what I think probably suits um, a lot of uh, you park owners. Um, minimum loan size: seven hundred and fifty thousand to um, five million in the Fannie Mae Small Balance Program. Generally, um, five, seven, 10, 12, 30 year terms. Amortization, 25 to 30 years. It is non-recourse financing. 80% um, uh, uh, on acquisition, 75% uh, cash out refi. Uh, the underwriting parameters, you know, generally, you know, these are going to be stabilized properties. One will underwrite to a one two five debt cover. Um, you know, look to see, you know, ninety percent occupancy, eighty five to ninety percent occupancy for the three months prior to closing. Um, the small balance program, uh, one of the, you know positive points, um, you know, the costs at fee and um, legal, you're probably going to send in like $7,500 with the signed app um, at closing, um, you know, you'll probably have another $4,500 um, for legal and uh, underwriting. So your total, you know, you're going to be around $12,000. Fannie does have, um, you know, conventional program. Costs are going to be a little bit more, but, um, you know, can accommodate larger parks above the $5 million loan size. Um, again, similar parameters, just accommodates um, um, larger, larger loans. Um, so great programs. We do have Freddie also. Freddie, another agency product, um, will finance um, mobile home parks. They're, um, I would say on the small balance side, Fannie, very popular program. Um, interest rate wise, uh, you know, right now for a 10 year deal, um, probably a little above 4%, low fours. Um, so, a very competitive pricing. Um, but again, for stabilized properties, around 90% occupancy. Um, at my boot, at my table, um, I've talked to some of you. I do have um, some flyers if you need some more information or you want it in writing in terms of some of the terms for the agency financing. Um, so, look forward to any questions. Um, and I'll hand it over to Lou.
morning, Lou Villa. Feels good to be back in Atlanta and we'll see her with Green Tree in charge of construction loans and also uh, bridge loans and mezz loans. Uh, Q10 Capital is a national mortgage bankers. We not only originate loans, about 5.7 million a year. So we're about seventh largest and the same size as uh, Sunbank and Fifth Third Bank and Sever and, and BMT. We do a lot of conduit loans as well. The important thing is that we're doing the full, full thing from eight MH loans to RV loans now and park models. So you have all three, but the name of this panel is to get you the money. And I would say to try to go in the next six to nine months, it's your best time. Loans are almost at an all-time low, from 3.8 to about 4.5, depending upon uh, you know, the MSA, the market, the quality of the loan, and the size. Uh, we do go a small balance, same way, 750,000. Our average tends to be around 10 million. And again, that's all non-recourse. Um, some advantages are that uh, having been a construction lender and also a chateau, uh, the advantages we have is to try to get you the best deal. For example, in case you have a lot of rental rental homes, our ratios and we can get them accepted up, up to 50%, which uh, you know was not able to uh, be done before. Uh, loans right now are right back to where they were 10 years ago, in 2006 and 2007. So I would go through your balance sheet and uh, see which loans are coming due. It might even behoove you to pay off an existing loan now and get a new loan with terms up to 30 years, in case you have a, a family type of community park. And also, the biggest thing of all is we're back to doing 10 years of interest only. So, uh, you know, it's a good time to be a borrower. Thank you all. My initial question, and then we're going to um, ask you all to, uh, to, to raise your hands. I need some help with the microphones. I don't see any purple shirt people here today. So, if I can have a couple of people, there's one microphone here and one here. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, my first question is, um, some of these uh, people that are anxious to get into a property, yeah, they're going to be buying some very ugly properties, 50% occupied, a lot of upside, a lot of work needed to be done. Uh, do any of you want to talk about whether that fit just doesn't fit you or, or what the different programs are? Uh, we obviously know the interest rates are a bit higher if you're involved, but what can you say about very unstabilized products if you uh, allude to your first? Well, the important thing on trying to get a loan such as that done is really your track record, okay? Uh, if you can prove to us as well as to the bank, the national bank or regional bank, that you have a history of value added, we uh, can get it done. But if this is your first deal, second or third deal, uh, I'm afraid it will be a tough call. To add anybody else or I'll jump in. Um, kind of the way we look at it, uh, obviously occupancy is uh, something that we do look at, but we're not uh, we're not so concerned whether that occupancy is 50%, 70%, 90%, um, as long as it's a cash flowing property, as long as the equity is in the deal, as long as debt service coverage is good. Um, it doesn't make as much um, difference to us, and particularly for an acquisition. Um, if if you're, you're you're buying a property that is say 50 percent occupied that does need some work, um, if it's already cash flowing from day one based on your down payment um, and based on the current cash flows of the park, the way we look at it is that's an opportunity for um, you know an experienced community owner to uh, you know grow cash flow. Um, so it's it's not something a, a lower uh, lower occupancy on stabilized properties. That's not necessarily something that scares us away. We we do the analysis on it just like it was 100% occupied and um, see what loan amount makes sense. Question? The one thing I would add to what they were saying is you know, the deal size is also going to make a huge difference. Yeah. Um, 
know, a smaller deal with those types of characteristics are almost best fit for a local bank or a state bank who understands the local real estate, they're very relationship-based, and like Lou said, they're gonna to wanna to see a great track record. On a larger scale, if you're talking, you know, five to $10 million deal with those types of elements, you know, even some of the most institutional lenders out there can get, potentially get comfortable with the deal, and you know, we, we've done this year Fannie and Freddie deals at 60 and 70% occupancy, which just a few years ago, they would have never touched anything below 85, 90% occupancy. So I would say that the deal size also can drive you know, that loan request in, in a few different directions. No. There's not many. I, I can go. Yeah, you have a two-part question. Um, in terms of your agency lenders and conduit lenders, how many street park on homes? What what percentages are going to be cut off points on that? And then is there any advantage to putting those park on homes in a separate entity than the, the entity holding the real estate? Or do they still treat them all as park on homes? Second question would be those same lenders, how do they treat uh, RV components to mobile home parks? Are there certain cut off points in terms of percentages for they not going to do the deal if there's a uh, RV component? So your first first part of your question, in regards to whether they're gonna want you to have those homes in a separate entity or prefer that, it's, it's actually gonna be mandatory for an agency loan and for most conduit loans that those homes be in a separate entity. Uh, the reason why is they're gonna want a single purpose entity that only owns the community and does not own the titles of, of those homes. Um, they're also gonna prefer and, and, and usually require for you to have that income separated on your PL statements so that you can track just the lot rent that's coming from all the, all the occupied homes, even if half of them are maybe rentals, and have a separate line item for where that home rent is coming in. And then the second part of your question was uh, in terms of what percentages? Or well, there's some of that, you know, I think I've heard like 40, beyond 40% they get uncomfortable with that in terms of park on homes. You know, that's a number that a few years ago, you know, seemed to kind of start at you know, 10 to 20 percent park on homes, and we've slowly worked our way up to where there's no exact threshold, and it just depends on all the variables of the deal. You know, if you bring them, if you bring lenders a, a park in a you know top 100 or top 50 MSA, and parks 100 percent full, and maybe a quarter or half of the homes are park on homes, they're going to be fine with that. Whereas if you bring them a park in a tertiary market where half the homes might be park on homes, and there's also quite a few vacancies, so there's a little bit of a struggle there. Um, you know, they might not be as comfortable with that same percentage. So all the variables really do make a huge difference in those situations. We've done parks with, you know, 50% park on homes and just separated out the income and valued it on a lot rent basis. Um, and then there's actually a few examples of, of conduit lenders taking collateral of all the homes, including it in the actual loan itself, giving it some credit and valuing some of that income on a discounted basis. But it also leads to a lot of structure um, that can get fairly complex and expensive for a smaller deal. So they'll usually only do that for you know 10 plus million dollar deals, and it's very much case by case, and it's sort of even frowned upon within the you know condo world. Can you explain to the group uh, the difference between a conduit lender that would, would merge the homes and land together and an agency lender who won't? Uh, just so that everyone in the audience understands the difference. So, so your agency loans are going to be your Fannie Mae and your Freddie Mac, and then your condo loans are going to be your, your private market securitizations. And frankly, neither one is usually taking collateral of the homes. You know, when I, I was just mentioning an example of, of a few cases where a conduit lender has tried to be creative and take taking those homes as collateral, uh, but Fannie, and, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac will never give any credit towards the ex, you know the premium of the home rent you're collecting, and again, they're going to require that in a separate entity. Um, okay. and, and just to touch on the RV component of your question, we've, we've also been successful in getting MHRV hybrid parks through either conduit sources or through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They look at it on a more conservative basis. You know, They'll look at the mobile home component just as aggressively as they would on any mobile home park. The RV component, they'll look at it at a, you know, almost at a discounted basis. You know, rather than being 75% loan to value on that aspect of the park, they might be 65% or 50%. When you blend it across the entire deal, rather than being at full leverage, you know, 75%, they might be at 65 to 70% of that deal. 
Just to add, on for agency purposes in terms of the number of park-owned homes, while I agree with you know pretty much everything that Chris has said, I would just say for rule of thumb, you know, looking at it initially, 25 to 35 percent is kind of the threshold for Fannie Mae. They'll look at it. That's not to say that they won't allow higher percentages. I mean, you can always request waivers and things like that. But dust lenders, you know, have some leeway because Fannie has kind of loosened up in terms of quality of parks and certain other parameters to allow, um, you know, more mobile home parks to be financed through the agency. So um, they, they are very interested in, you know, financing parks and have eased up on their guidelines. So for what that's worth. Um, with regard to the agency and um, do, um, what kind of quality uh, or uh, park attributes such as curbs, driveways, uh, city services, etc., are necessary in order to you know, qualify or disqualify a particular park? Are you asking about the, uh, the smaller agency program, like the 5 million, or the larger? And what does it make a difference? Uh, well, uh, okay. well, I just wanted to go back there a little bit on the, those type of loans that we're talking about, we call call them hybrid, okay? And what you all should do, Fannie is extremely strict, okay? We were uh, an agency land number for nine out of 12 years with, you know, the record, you do get the waivers. If you have such a park, you should go first to Pratt and Mac, because with Fannie, it has to fit exactly in that square. If not, they'll turn you down in most cases. So Freddie is really the new lender, and you'll go up to 50% with Freddie, which Fannie, Fannie won't, won't do. Okay, uh, back here. So here's, we're working on the project, this is kind of a real-time thing. So we've got a park built in 1970, it's got many of the original homes. It's near a college campus, so the only one home is 100% occupied, and almost treating it like a horizontal apartment building. Where the rents are, there's one rent that's not separated out by the house, it's not separated out by a lot, you really can't. Um, the house is obviously a negligible, um, negligible value to them because of the age. How? Well, well, we're not separating out the value of the homes from the value of the, of the real estate. How would you guys, how would you guys line that in? Would any of you then 100% uh, rental or have any programs built 100% rental or does he need to just physically redo his books and, and separate them out so that he would get some money just for the land portion of the, of the cash flow? Yep. And you're in, is this a Mississippi property? No, Mississippi. We're not putting any value on the physical, we're not putting any value on the actual home. It's, it's you know, it's 300 bucks a month for rent, period. But, but part of that rent is for the for the home portion of it. I, I suppose, but you can't you, you can't really separate it out because it's okay. kind of just there. The reason I asked about Mississippi, we did have another uh, um, attendee that's in, in, in a, in a, in a uh, college town in Mississippi who was asking similar questions. Well, I'll just say one thing. You've got to start now to separate your accounting, okay? Because that's crucial. Okay? I mean, we call it, we all provide, most of us do, what we call pre-sizing of a loan. Okay? So let's say you think it's, uh, your loan should be three million, you send us your rent rule, we go through the numbers, what we call scrubbing the numbers. Okay? We all do this, right, Chris? And, uh, and then we'll come back to you. It's a free, free look, if you want. It's like an appraisal. And we'll see what things are in line and what is not in line. But you should break out your rental rental, especially the repairs on the rental homes or rental apartments. You gotta keep that separate. And you should keep separate to your sales company, XYZ, whatever it is. Yeah, and I, I, I have to say I agree with it. And it takes work, but there are a lot of rentals in your community where someone just rents a lot maybe it's $100 or $200 or $275. So there is a component 
the flaw in health, and then that most importantly is saying well, all your expenses when you're repairing toilets and refrigerators, that's not a lot of expense, that's a house expense. So you've got to take the time, and these companies will help you scrub your books to get it ready for a loan, correct? All of you do that? Sure. Yes. The alternative okay, to no, doing okay. that would just simply be if, if you ultimately didn't want to have to conform to that type of you know arrangement, you would just have to work with you know usually a either local bank or state bank that's not going to ask you to necessarily separate it out and they'll just look at the property on a global cash flow basis. But you know that's a lot more case by case and bank by bank. Yeah. One more question. Um, yeah, just if I can readjust my question, I don't think I ever got an answer with regard to uh, park attributes, curbs, driveways, etc. Uh, state services that may be required for uh, an agency loan or separately a conduit loan. Well, yes. Uh, regarding Fannie, and uh, I'll let you speak to Fannie. The answer is yes. Well, you know, yeah, the I really know I well, the you need curbs. Okay? You need all street parking. You know, the curb appeal's got, got to be plus plus. Quality of the park has got to be three star or four star. You know, they aren't going to go down to a three minus star or, or, or two star park. Now, again, you get far more flexibility with Freddie, because Fred is a new source on the block. Yeah, and, and generally what I, what I try to do there are density requirements. Um, there are several things. What I do initially with all mobile home park requests is there's a checklist, a fanny checklist. And, you know, I have the owner fill out the checklist and just see, and we can see where we're off. And like I said, Fannie has given the desk lenders some flexibility in terms of allowing certain things to, to to be accepted, density in particular, you know, is one. Um, if that is the norm for that market, you know, for instance, single whites, they want to see double and single whites. You know, they, they try to see if there are uh, pads that can accept doubles and, and the percentages that can or can't. And, um, but flex, uh, Fannie has given flexibility to dust lender to let some things go to be able to finance. I would say three three star parks, they will accept. And uh, uh, like I say, the checklist, it'll say where you're off. And, and you know, there are always, there's always the ability for a park that meets or, or is similar to all those in the, the area um, to miss on some of those points and still be financed. You can't okay. miss on all of them. You can't them. miss on you all. You don't have you can miss any on of some. those points, then the agencies just can't work with you. So it's, it's, it, it's miss as few as possible and you've got, you've got a, reason, a better chance. Yep. You know, we, we've, just this year alone, we've gotten done you know, Fannie Mae loans on parks with no off-street parking, um, higher density in urban metros, you know, parks where you know, maybe a third or a quarter of the homes still had the hitches on them. Um, and so it, it really has completely changed. Just a few years ago, I'm sure everyone's idea of a Fannie Mae loan meant, you know, you needed to have a five-star park with very wide roads, sidewalks, city utilities, you know, full amenities package, and, you know, primarily double-wide homes. But they, they're certainly, they've certainly opened up to all sorts of parks ever since Freddie Mac entered the space two years ago with more flexible requirements and realized they were going to have to compete and stop cherry-picking their deals. Um, so any deal that is over a million and a half dollars, stable, 90% occupancy, maybe no more than, you know, 10 or 12 to the acre, we're taking to the agencies and we're usually, if not getting a full leverage quote, at least getting a conservative quote out of them. And then the second part of your question in terms of conduit loans, anything that's cash flowing steady shows, you know, no worse than maybe a two and a half star where you don't have, you know, a quarter of the homes abandoned and, you know, and broken glass. We're, we're able to get them through the conduit process. Um, we've done parks in, you know, areas like Miami where it's truly more of a trailer park where you could, you know, touch, you know, could touch both sides of the homes, you know, in terms of density, um, you know, 20, 30 amps on, on, on very old, almost park model style homes, and, you know, conduit loans, you know, conduit lenders will get those done as long as they debt cover. 
All right, we've gone a little bit into our lunch time because we started late, but this is a, a very, very uh, educated panel here. And so continue your questions. Don't forget to text your votes, but let's give a, uh, uh, a round of applause to this guy. Now we're meeting at 1 o'clock. Let's say we came back at 2. We're restarting at 1 o'clock, so you have about an hour and 15 minutes for lunch down between the homes. But I'll be back at 1 o'clock. Thank you all.